So I'll just quickly introduce Scott. Um, Scott Assault is here to present his new photo documentary on Mothers of Nature, which is looking at the, um, a, <clears throat> a new project that empowers women to, um, to invest in protecting and restoring mangrove forests in Sri Lanka. And really you've been looking at the, the role of women in, in, this, uh, in these nature-based solutions, really. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, my name is Scott. Um, I'm um, a commercial travel and independent documentary photographer and filmmaker. In um, 2017, I was due to go on what was primarily a surfing trip to Sri Lanka. Um, so in the run up to that trip, I did some, did some research because whilst I was there, I wanted to maybe produce a, a small project. Um, and during my research, I came across an article um, which stated that in 2015, Sri Lanka had been the first country in the world to protect 100% of its remaining mangrove forest. Um, this decision largely came about because of the work of an NGO in Sri Lanka called Sedesa, um, and a sort of pioneering model of conservation that they they devised over the years. Um, one of the main things that struck me about this particular conservation project was the really positive and holistic way that it approached conservation, but also um, a, a humanitarian crisis um, through the empowerment of local women. Um, the country has had um, a lot of um, a lot of hardship in in recent years and has you know many sort of visible visible scars um so obviously 2004 was the tsunami and the um and the civil war has only just ended in the last 10 years as well um and these two these two things created a lot of instability in the country, but they also created a lot of widows in the country. And as a result, these widows became the main provider for the families. So this project set out to help these women as well as conserve the country's vital mangrove forest. So prior to my trip, I got in contact with the NGO Sidesa um, and stated I'd be in the country for around four weeks over Christmas and New Year. And I'd love to come and shoot in a variety of different locations and get a first-hand experience of the project. Um, they got back to me and said they'd love that, but um, because of the time of year, there wasn't going to be anyone from the NGO that was around. So I did a little bit more, um, a bit more research, um, mainly into sort of mangroves and the, the way they work and the systems. I found out that they're incredibly important to... Uh, the local fishers as they provide breeding grounds and nurseries for a huge variety and different species of fish and crustaceans, a lot of which um, are commercially viable um, for the fishing community. So I took any opportunity whilst I could, whilst I was there, to document either morning fish markets or traditional methods of fishing. And at the end of the trip, um, I was happy with the, um, the array of images that I've got. Um, these are a few images from that first trip. Um, and then I, I then send, I sent these images across to the NGO, just sort of stating that I've been kind of working a little bit solo on this and that I'd love to come back and and be involved um, in the actual project and things. So yeah, as I say, I sent these images across to the NGO um, and they were really happy with them. And we worked together over the next sort of eight months discussing, discussing ways that I could, I could go out there and ways I could work with them. Um, my motivations for producing the projects were really simple. It was to produce a positive environmental story. Um, I, think, I think today it's, it's very overwhelming, the amount of 
um, issues and negative stories that you can kind of see in the media. And I kind of wanted to do something that was that was really positive and something that, that provided some some kind of hope, really. Um, so from my research, I had a really strong visual concept of what I wanted to shoot and what I needed to shoot in order to tell the story. Um, despite the regular regular contact that we had, um, there were still a lot of unanswered questions, and it was more of a case of kind of getting on a flight, arriving, and sort of discussing these in person. But when I arrived, I met Anu, who is Sudessa's director and the person that conceived the project in the first place. Um, he tells this really beautiful story about how he was doing his dissertation and witnessed a mother and a, her young son one day on the mud flats. The son had asked his mother what, what she was moving and she said that she was planting a mangrove seed because that's what brings the fish to us. So that was probably 35 years ago and that's part of his dissertation and that sort of there was a catalyst for the whole project as it is today. Um, so this is uh, Putalam Lagoon and this is where Sudessa's Mangrove Museum is situated and where we had our first meeting. And they, we took a boat ride all around this lagoon system, which is huge. Um, and I was quite surprised to learn that a lot of the mangroves here had only been planted within the last 10 to 15 years as part of that, part of that project. So one of the huge um, issues that faces um, mangrove forest in Sri Lanka and many other countries is deforestation. Um, in the last hundred years in Sri Lanka, 80% of its mangrove forest have been destroyed. Um, and a lot of that has become in the last 30 to 40 years. This is due to a variety of factors. However, aquaculture and primarily shrimp farming and salt production are certainly one of the, one of the highest ones. Um, so right from the start of the trip, at our first location in Chalor, which is where this aerial image was taken. Um, you can see the extent of the shrimp farming industry and the areas of mangrove that have been cleared to, to make way for, for big business, essentially. Um, in the 1980s, there was a huge boom in shrimp farming around the world. And looking at the commercial success of neighbouring countries like Thailand and the Philippines, Sri Lanka followed suit and started to build shrimp farms all around the island. Um, unfortunately, ideal conditions for shrimp farms are also the mangrove forest natural habitat. That sort of mixture of fresh water and salt water is, is ideal for shrimp farms. So this led to widespread de defore deforestation and um, yeah, local communities ended up sort of paying the price really. Not only did they not benefit from the mangrove or the natural protection or fish stocks, but the shrimp farms very rarely employed local people because they deemed them untrustworthy and thought they might steal. Um, yeah. So here are a few images from around some of the shrimp farms. This is inside um, a prawn hatchery, which is essentially like a double garage. It has about six of these large drums in. Um, and I think, I think the guy was saying that he could, he could, he could hatch 250,000 prawns in one of, in one of these, uh, one of these drums. Um, so this is a night watchman from um, supposedly what we were going to check out as um, an abandoned shrimp farm. However, when we turned up around sunset, um, we saw that it was very much functional um, and chatted to some of the locals who informed us that as recent as a few days ago, um, heavy machinery and JCBs had been in the area removing mangroves. So this is three years after they've passed the law to 100% protect the mangrove forest. Um, so we took a few, two sh a few shots um, in the evening, but to get an extent of the, 
um, of the operation and wanted to go back during the day. So we left, and bear in mind we're in that Jeep that's behind this gentleman here. We're in, behind, in that Jeep, which is government branding, says mangrove protection on it, all that kind of thing. And the, 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 um, the guy that we're with gets a phone call to basically say, anonymous phone call to basically say, if we return the next day to shoot as planned, we'll be met with heavy security forces. So do you want to come back and do it or not? So we kind of discussed it and yeah, and thought and thought about it, um, but returned the next day um, and shot anyway. And we were met with absolutely no one. It was just a bluff. But it's quite interesting speaking to the locals. The locals suggested um, that this particular um, site was owned by a quite high up politician. So yeah, <laughs> I'll leave that to your own imagination. But I think this is one of the most important images I shot um, because it shows not only the, the fact that the, um, in the bottom left that the shrimp farm is functioning, but it also shows that these ponds to the right and to the top have been dug out for expansion. So what we were told was a disused, abandoned shrimp farm is actually fully operational and expanding. And that's one of the, one of the issues uh, and one of the still the big challenges that they face. Um, is, it's a lot to do with corruption um, and obviously with with anything that makes a lot of money, people are going to do do a lot to a lot to keep that. Um, and this is um, this is similar, but this is a, a salt farm, an aerial shot of a salt farm. So this is Joani, and she's one of the first women I met as part of the problem, uh, part of the project. Sorry. Joanne is a mother of three daughters and the sole provider for her family. So how the project works um, in Sri Lanka is that women from local communities will attend a five day training session, which not only teaches them about the importance of the mangrove forest and how to protect it, but they also learn skills to start or expand uh, their own businesses. And at the end of the five days, um, they can take out a micro loan to help them start, start a business. Um, as Sri, Lank Sri Lanka's mangroves are all around the island, it's not possible for Sudesa to have that many staff sort of situated around the, uh, around the coastal regions. So instead what they've done is created community-based organizations. So these are um, usually between 10 and 15 women who take part in the project, who run their own businesses and have weekly get togethers to discuss everything from the protection of the mangrove forests to their own businesses, or literally just to sit around and have a cup of tea and sort of enjoy each other's company. Um, one of the key uh, focuses of the project is to reforest the mangroves and provide local communities with the benefits that they supply. Um, fish is, what a, is obviously a main factor, um, but after 2004, people found that areas that had mangrove co coverage had significantly less damage and significantly less loss of life due to the tsunami. Um, so mangroves act as natural barriers from storms and tsunamis. And in the aftermath of 2004, this has become incredibly important uh, to people living in coastal communities. This is uh, another shot of them um, taking part of the, the replanting, which is, this, uh, this takes place as part of the, uh, the five day training session as well. So this is Chandra Palan and her son in her old house, which was destroyed by the tsunami in 2004. Um, just out of shot behind, behind me, essentially, is, is her new home, which uh, Sudesa, the NGO, 
helped um, helped her build after after the tsunami. So, as we travelled around the entire entire island, I got a real sense of how much this project is is and has changed people's lives. Um, a lot of the women not only have the chance to build their own businesses and a way to support their families, but they've built lots of lasting relationships with the other women in their communities that they meet. Um, and a lot of them have, have become sort of real activists um, in, in terms of mangrove um, pr protection. This is Pri Mantharan, um, and this is her standing, standing next to the mangrove forest um, to the entrance to her home in Manar. Um, she runs a small sewing business and has done for around seven years um, and has two children. And one of, uh, from speaking to her, one of, one of her main um, reasons for joining the project um, was that she feels incredibly strongly about um, expanding the forest to provide natural protection from storms and tsunamis. Um, this is Jerisa, who, like many women in part of the, uh, uh, who take part in the projects, is a widow and relies on her own business to support uh, and feed her family. Uh, yeah, this, this lady would only give her initial actually at the time, which is, which is S, but, um, yeah, quite an incredible, incredible story. Um, she's been displaced from the home that she's standing outside of on no less than three separate occasions. Um, once due to domestic violence, once due to the civil war and once due to the tsunami where she also lost her grandson. Um, one thing that struck me about her was how composed she was in telling this incredibly emotive, emotive story. Um, obviously, I haven't got time to go into, into the detail, but it, yeah, it really, really, really struck a chord with me. Um, she's now enrolled in the project. She took out a microloan she invested in some fishing equipment and she hires it out to, to local, local fishermen. Um, and she uses any profits that she can to, um, to try and rebuild her home essentially, um, which is still uh, sort of in a bit of ruin since the, well, since the tsunami. Um, this is Del San. Um, Del San now actually works directly for Sudessa um, and yeah another another sort of very defiant and incredible incredible story in the, um, at the sort of height of the civil war um, her father went off to fight for the Sri Lankan military and was injured breaking both of his legs um, <clears throat> and about a year later the territory that they were in came under control of the Tamil Tigers. At that time it was um, it was customary for at least one person from each household in their area to fight for the Tamil Tigers. As the only able-bodied person in her household, she was then drafted in, given I think it was about two to three months training and then sent into battle. She was then um, yeah, caught in, caught in crossfire between the Sri Lankan military and the Tamil Tigers um, in essentially what became a massacre. Um, got away with her life, um, but obviously, as you can see, uh, lost an arm in the, in the process. But again, another amazing woman who you know, has two kids, runs her own business, part of the NGO. Um, and this is Mary and Christy. Um, so a few years ago, Christy stood on an unexploded landmine, which was left over from the war. He was previously a fisherman, but now has uh, severe trouble walking and as a result can't fish. So uh, Mary and Christy have 
um, well, Mary's become involved in the project and then Mary and Christy have set up their own business, which prim primarily produces and fixes fishing equipment, so nets and things like that. This is our Jantha. Uh, she's a mother of three. She runs a local shop in the Eastern province. Um, and yeah, she, she just, yeah, I mean, I think her face says it all really, but she takes her role as an educator in the community very seriously. So one of the great things um, about the project is that it really empowers the women to pass on the knowledge um, that they've learned about the mangrove forests, the benefits that it brings the community. Um, and yeah, just passing on that information is really key. Um, and this is Leela. Um, Leela is the oldest member of the project at 77. Um, and yeah, had no problem whatsoever posing for the camera or getting into those, uh, getting into those marshes. Um, just off camera, there's about six or seven Sri Lankan women trying to do their very best to put her off and make her laugh during this photograph. Um, some, of the out, some of the outtakes are, are pretty hilarious. Um, yeah, so Sudesa uses a really holistic approach to conservation and a really empowering um, way to, to work with women in coastal communities. And that's one of the things that struck me um, really a lot about the project. Um, so the civil war has only been over for around 10 years. Um, there's still a lot of remnants from that. This is one of the hundreds of buildings I saw mainly in the Northern province many of which have been bombed out and bore bullet holes in the wall. Um, towards the end of the war, the Sri Lankan military um, essentially carpet bombed a lot of the north of the country in an effort to flush out the Tamil Tigers. Um, and in doing so, destroyed huge areas of mangrove forest as the Tamil Tigers were using it as cover. Um, however, in recent years, um, the military have now come in, specifically the Navy, um, have now come in and joined the effort to start replanting a lot of the mangrove um, that was destroyed during the war in the north. Um, this is Commander Perez, looking very happy with himself. <laughs> So, yeah, in, in Sri Lanka, there's around 20 species of mangrove. I think there's around 100 or so in the world. Um, this particular mangrove bears fruit, hence the bats which live, live in the trees. Um, and um, the local women also use the fruit to mix with coconut milk to make um, a really exceptional smoothie. Um, that's provided the bats have left them any fruit to, any fruit to do that with. So the next step for this project is to take it to an international stage. The conservation project itself was selected as one of, um, one of 25 projects out of um, around 1200 applicants for the Global Best Practice Programme, which is gonna be at D uh, Dubai Expo, which is now 2021. Um, and the NGO have, have asked me if these images and this work can feature very prominently as an exhibition within that space to try and tell the story, um, but also try and um, try and get it in front of you know other governments and policy makers and people like that because the model of conservation um that has been devised there is incredibly beneficial but could be extremely transferable to a, a number of different countries um i'm also working with um a variety of people to try and secure funding 
so that we can go back and create a feature length documentary of this project to again um, try and try and further the uh, the reach um, and information about it and we're looking to and chatting to people such as sort of Netflix BBC in terms of in terms of trying to get that off the ground and um, but at the minute we're still at, still at the funding stage so but yeah very very hopeful to go back soon when we're allowed <laughs> when we're allowed to go anywhere Um, does anyone have any questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Scott. That was really, really amazing. It's just, um, we're always talking about the importance of nature-based solutions for building socioeconomic resilience and for empowering women. And then you just bring it to life so beautifully and really make it home, bring it home. Um, I do have questions, but I'm, I'll open the floor to everyone yeah. else first. Uh, thank you, Scott. That's beautiful. Really, really lovely imagery as well. Really evocative storytelling. Uh, uh, well, I'll just kick off with one question. Firstly, I, I didn't quite get a sense of the scale of the project. How many uh, Sorry, parts yeah. of Sri Lanka are covered? How many people are involved, etc.? So, so it's, it's basically all around, uh, all around the island. And the, um, in terms of the women, um, they are, I believe it's 13,000 women that are involved in the in the project nationwide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's but yeah, well, as 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 we travelled around, it was we 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 pretty much stopped every sort of 20, 30 kilometers to to kind of like stop with a, a group of people or at someone's business or anything like that. Yeah. yeah that's good. And uh, uh, I got the impression that the government is largely supportive of this project, or is it sort of? Uh, but particular local politicians and they feel their vested interests. Uh, really yeah, the government is on the whole um, very supportive of it and obviously passed the legislation in, in 2015 to, to sort of, you know, come out and say that they were 100% protecting it. However, you know, after sort of having those, those sort of late at night conversations, with people, you you delve down and get to realise that you know there's still a, there's still a high level of corruption going on, and where money can be made, unfortunately, quite often the environment will be sacrificed for that. Yeah, my question was related to that actually. If if did you get a feel for how well the extent of the of the corruption and and how women are dealing with it and if. Is there a way, is there a plan to respond to that? Um, in terms of the level of corruption, I, I got a sense that it was, you know, very much um, an, ongoing, uh, an ongoing issue and not just in the realm of the mangrove forest. One of the, one of the, um, the guys from the NGO told me a story about how he knew someone um, who was allowed to just cut down some pristine forest right in the middle of the country to, to build a massive hotel. Um, and he basically just did this by bribing a government official. So, you know, there's, there's a huge, huge issue of, of corruption. In terms of the women, um, as I say, like quite a few of them have become sort of pretty activist about it. Um, so the, the, the way they're supposed to protect is to, is just to report um, any issues to either the, lo the local police or local authorities. However, often in these sort of situations, um, so with the shrimp farm that I, that I showed, uh, the locals said that they had contacted the local police, but they've obviously been paid off. So they were just completely, you know, they wouldn't do anything about it. Um, but as I say, yeah, some of the women have, have, have just taken it upon themselves to, you know, be activists and, and go out and sort of and face people head on in a variety of situations, really. Um, as it stood whilst I was there, I didn't really get a, sen a, um, a sense of a plan in terms of tackling corruption as such. Um, but I mean, there were obviously people very much invested in, in doing so. Hmm. <laughs> Um, oh, I think we have a question. Um, so my question is around the technique of a photo story. You're obviously pretty good. 
<laughs> uh, do we know what works and has there been any research into it? Also, does it show that we should be encouraging science researchers to use a lot more photos rather than the usual token one or two because of the importance of visual um, knowledge engagement? Um, what was the first part of the question, sorry? Um, so in, in terms of your, the technique of taking a photo story, what works and is there any research in, into how to do a best photo document? Okay. Yeah, so um, in, terms of, um, in terms of technique, it's, it's sort of something that I've just, I just tried to sort of cultivate myself really. Um, I find the use of uh, the drone really, really key in terms of um, establishing um, a scene or um, for, so for obviously for the for the shots with the, the shrimp farms and things like that you know it, it would be very difficult to to get a scale of that operation without those aerial images so I think I think using the aerial images as well as the you know the very sort of relationship sort of images with the with the people the sort of first hand the portraits that you know um, and, 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 and getting a sense of, of those stories as well um, that, go, that go with them. Um, but in yeah, in terms of a technique, it's, yeah, it's just something that I've, I've, I've come, to, come to learn over the years. I think, I think it's a mixture. It's come from a mixture of um, my background, which is sort of travel, commercial, photography, and, but just, just very interested in taking pictures of people as well. Um, yeah, but in, uh, yeah, I guess um, to for the latter part of the question, um, from my point of view, <laughs> I'd certainly say that images and video would be would be better would be better used in uh, in, in sort of conservation efforts and things like that. Um, and I've kind of yeah, I've kind of now made it made it my purpose to do at least kind of one of these types of projects a year. Um, some of the most recent one is is now in in Vietnam in the um, in the Mekong Delta, and I think I think telling these these stories through uh, through images and video is is one of the is one of the more powerful ways of getting it across to a to a larger audience. And you'll be mainly focusing on on nature restoration protection project uh, in Vietnam. Everywhere, yeah. Everywhere, yeah. So yeah, so for the next, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Essentially, everything's going to be environmentally based. Yeah, that's brilliant. I hope we can work with you more on this. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, thanks, Ian. That was a question from Ian. I think. Does anyone else have questions? Oh yes, I've got a question. Um, hi. Hi. So that, yeah, that was really interesting. So um, I'm working with people in Bangladesh at the moment, and obviously there's a lot of you know, really important mangroves there as well. So I was really interested in what you said about the um, conflict between the local people um, and the, fisher, the fishermen and the, the fact that the aquaculture is mainly um, sort of international business rather than employing the local people. So, so do the local people kind of reject the aquaculture? Do they not see it as playing any role at all in supporting their own livelihoods? Um, yeah, very much so in a lot of areas. Um, yeah, since the, since the 80s, the vast majority of the the shrimp and prawn produced there is to go out is to be exported to um, to Japan and um, the European Union that kind of thing and, because, and, and I think there is that mistrust there between the local communities and the and the sort of bigger bigger organizations especially as I mentioned that they completely as well as cutting down the mangroves they completely missed out on any employment opportunities because they were they just weren't trusted they were they were expected to steal the harvest um so yeah i think there is a, a, a deal of animosity between the two i mean if you could send any any links to the project as a whole that would be really interesting because our contacts in bangladesh are very keen to find examples of um where where other governments around the world have adopted mbs and, and got them actually working so this sounds like a potentially really useful case study 
Yeah, no, that's great. Well, I think um, I think in the last couple of weeks, actually, there's um, there's a there's a full case study that has that has come out about the rather specifically about this project that's been done by um, by Harvard, I think. So I could, okay. I could send a link a link across to that, um, and that gives a you know a really detailed description of what's going on. That sounds perfect. Thanks. Yeah, please share that. Yeah, we'll we'll share it with everyone. Yeah, of course. I have another question if no one else has one. Uh, you mentioned you know, one of the things that's exciting in Dubai is the potential that this project could be replicated or scaled in other countries. Now, what do you think are the features of this project that, that are the things that could or should be duplicated in other places? Yeah, to me, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's one of my, my sort of main uh, vested interests, really, is to, is, is to get other countries to... Um, is to implement it. I think on um, obviously on a local on a local scale, it it really help it really helps the community. Um, it provides things like flood defences, storm defences, things like that. But I think on a global scale, um, one thing that I, that, I, that I learned that I didn't previously know about mangrove forests is the is the amount of carbon that they sequester, which is you know like um, I think the last time I read it. Uh, the last research was about five times more than any other tropical forest, which I found quite staggering. And um, after research looking into, you know, how much mangrove forest had been had been lost in, in the last 50 years, like globally, I think a, a global resurgence and um, a reforestation of mangrove forest could, um, you know, could go, could go a long way to, to, to really sort of help the, Help the environmental crisis, um, and obviously we've, you know, we've been given the the sort of the the twelve years to kind of turn things around. And I think it could be could be really influential um, in in terms of doing that, especially because it's it's such a such a fast growing um, sort of um, sort of vegetation as well. Like the yeah the forest in Putlam Lagoon that I showed originally, I was sort of quite blown away that that had only been there for fifteen years. It kind of appeared to me that it could have been there hundreds of years, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, that's one of the, my main motivations is to, but then, all, but also, but also seeing, um, seeing what effects it has on an individual basis, on a family basis, on a way of just empowering women to um, not only provide for their families, but just, just, just the way they meet up and they they make new friends in their communities and they, you know you just, you, if you sit around them and they're just having a cup of tea and having a having a laugh and a joke it's it's a really great it's a really great thing to to see and and they've been brought together because of because of this project and I think I think that's probably transferable in a lot of countries if not all of them. Okay, I have, um, I have a couple more comments. One of them is just, um, Henry has to go, but he uh, thanks you. They're really amazing photos and you really enjoyed it. Um, and Ian was wondering again, so during snapping and posting these photos, do you find that you have a different perspective, which wouldn't happen if you were writing or data gathering or, or even filming and how's, how is your connection to the project different? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, th I think because obviously you you have you have an idea in your head when you're approaching a project of of how you want it to look and how you want it to go, and maybe about thirty percent of the time that happens, um, but then you're sort of rewarded with all these all these amazing different things that you were just completely unexpected um, or completely unplanned for. Um, but there is, there is a real personal, there is a real personal connection to, um, to the images because, because that was, um, that was also an experience at that time. And as I say, sort of, um, sort of meeting, meeting some of those women and them and them sharing some, highly emotive um sort of experiences and and stories from their past um to essentially some 
but some person that's just turned up on their doorstep relatively unannounced <laughs> um, for the most part or turned up to their business. Um, you know, you, you feel, if you, you, you become and you feel part of, of that project um, and, it, you know, their, their willingness to, to share those, those stories with you um, really, really invests you in the, in the projects. And as I say, I'm, I'm now really, really pushing for, for this model and this, uh, this, this series to be seen by sort of policymakers and other people because I feel like it could have such a positive effect on other people's lives um and that and yeah you know, that would be that would be great that would be great for great for them and you know a really really interesting way of um of, of seeing how image is used to create change essentially yeah and you must have a real personal connection with the people you photograph as you go along yeah yeah very much so um and as i say i'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to going back and sort of reconnecting with with some of the people as well. Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Everyone's gone quiet. Um, <laughs> about um, so these images, you how? I, I'm I'm sorry. For my ignorance, I don't really know how we, um, is it possible to buy some for websites or how do we work with you on, if, if we want to use any of the images to illustrate some projects or some points? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Don't, don't, I mean, don't worry about, um, don't worry about that. I'm, I'll, obviously, I'm just happy to, happy to sort of uh, proliferate the project as, as much as possible, really. So I'd be, I'd be delighted to, to work with anyone to, if they want to, if they want to use the images, yeah. Cool. Okay, so they just contact you and then you go from there, I guess. That's yeah, easiest. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm. That's brilliant. And it's lovely, you know, as Cecile was saying, we're looking at really, really nice, strong examples of nature-based solutions. But uh, this, this project seems to be very attractive in that, and, and because of that strong social dimension, the strong stories of these women and what they've been through as well, and as well as the the climate and ecological uh, benefit to that as well. So it's a very, very compelling story project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of the, so we're, the, the point of um, nature-based solutions, all the work we're doing on nature-based solutions compared to tr traditional conservation is that we're really, we're looking at how nature and people are working together and, and how it's a two-way relationship and, and that's it's amazing how you really just bring that to life well that's amazing yeah no, no, that's thanks great. so much no that's quite all right um if there's um, yeah if there's any other any other questions then um, that's my uh, website you can uh, anyone can get in get in touch with me via email or if anyone okay, works okay nice we'll, send that, we'll send that around there's one more question uh, from Ian is do you know Blue Ventures, Al Harris and Madagascar Plus? I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll send you that. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. That'd be yeah, so I'm intrigued. <laughs> the coral reef uh, restoration project in, in Madagascar, that's great. Yeah. Right, okay. No, that sounds good. Uh, crystal systems in Madagascar. Wow, yeah. No, I'd, I'd love yeah, I'd love to see anything about that. Yeah. So uh, great. It'd be really nice to perhaps to take one image from this with one of your slides and then tweet it out as well, just to sort of say that you know you've enjoyed that as well. So I don't know whether. Yeah, absolutely. Um, slide or something. Maybe yeah. you can send one afterwards too. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send one. I don't know if you've got a particular one in mind. <laughs> uh, I think well, your opening slide, or just just uh, you know. Well, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'd probably I'd probably say I'd probably say the opening slide sort of tells <laughs> the story the best, I would imagine. So yeah, I'll send that through. Uh, great. Thanks. No. Thank you. Okay, cool. And we'll, uh, we'll send all the information. Amazing. All right. Thank you very much for this morning. Bye. Appreciate Thanks so it. much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Scott. Bye. Thanks.